This essay derived from a conversation I had with Tolanda Henderson during the Harry Potter Studies section of the Southwest Popular and American Culture Association Conference four years ago. I meditated on the sad fate of mortals adrift on that sea of human opinions without rudder or compass, at the mercy of their stormy passions with no other guide than an inexperienced pilot who knows neither from where he has come nor what he is going. No doubt concerning the things most important for us to know is a stress too great for the human mind to endure for very long. We would rather be mistaken than believe nothing. We prefer to choose our certainties at random and believe in illusions rather than admit that none of us can perceive reality. Should the wisdom of Albus Dumbledore be trusted? Does Dumbledore always get it right? In the last novel of the series, the King's Cross Dumbledore talks with Harry. Harry asks about the enchantment that had been given him through his mother's loving self-sacrifice. The two of them also discuss the idea that something of this enchantment may have been delivered in some way to Tom Riddle through Riddle's own prior and uninvited use of Harry's blood. Harry asks, quote, and you knew this? You knew this all along? Dumbledore responds saying, I guessed, but my guesses have usually been good. Well, is this true? Has Dumbledore's guesses been good? Have they? Of course, there were Dumbledore's terrible decisions surrounding Grindelwald and the subsequent death of Ariana. Also, one wonders how Barty Crouch Jr. could impersonate Mad-Eye Moody for the better part of a year without raising suspicion. And there is also the issue of raising Harry as a, quote, pig for slaughter, a charge that he does not even deny. This, perhaps, is not the place for a discussion of the various and often mentioned problems with the educational structure of Hogwarts regarding privilege and the like. Despite these troubling examples, there can be little doubt that the Wizarding World turned to Albus Dumbledore in times of dire need, and we can largely concede that he often proved himself equal to those challenges. However, it may also be true that there are a few of us who would trust his wisdom or his judgment implicitly. Within the Harry Potter series, almost everything we see as readers is filtered through the point of view of Harry Potter himself. And for much of the series, Harry Potter is a child or young adult. Despite the fact that Harry has a rather permissive assessment of his own judgment regarding, for example, Severus Snape, Draco Malfoy, or school rules in general, he is also a boy who, like most children, turns to adults for important information or advice. Recall, for example, how desperately Harry yearns for Dumbledore's advice and insight during the Order of the Phoenix when that attention is deliberately withheld, or Professor Lupin's private Patronus lessons with Harry and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Of course, this may be true of most children and young adults. Despite their reputation for rebellion and crass disrespect, adolescents are constantly finding themselves presented with what is, for them, unprecedented challenges and are thus in constant need of reliable information and advice. Throughout the series, we see Harry reaching out to various adults for the advice or guidance he might have received from his parents under better circumstances. This search for parental surrogates is, it would seem, one of the central themes of the series. While young people seek to solve the problems of their own individual journey and adventure, they also look to find trusted voices they can use as guiding navigational stars. But whose voice can be trusted? We all know that Harry eventually becomes an auror. However, it was Barty Crouch Jr., polyjuiced as Mad-Eye Moody, who had originally suggested that idea while walking back to his room with Harry after the incident with the trick stare. Just after this, we will find Harry thinking, quote, and Moody thought he, he, Harry, ought to be an auror. Oh, what an interesting idea. Harry was following the advice of a man who was ex executing a plot that would, if all went as planned, include Harry's own death. For that matter, something similar could be said of Dumbledore. Some of the best and some of the worst things that happened to us happen to us as a result of precarious moments when we choose, perhaps only semi-consciously, to trust someone as a model, a guide, or inspirational voice. The world is wide and infinite in its complexity, both in expanding size and delicacy of detail. Comprehending such a thing is quite a challenge for the human mind, even if it can appear mundane in its everydayness. How does the human mind comprehend empirical reality when that experience is always infinite in the large, small, and temporal trajectories? How does the human mind comprehend the incomprehensible within the everyday? Well, in a matter of speaking, we cheat. It is the opinion or perhaps assertion of many philosophers and theologians spanning the ages that 
In terms of experiencing reality, we only bite off what we can chew. The world or universe that we experience every minute of every day is obviously infinite in the manner alluded to above, and such infinities are always beyond human comprehension. One can't, as they say, stuff the ocean into a thimble unless one is a very great witch or wizard indeed. What we do in the face of this dilemma is arbitrarily bracket off impending, looming infinities. We disregard the very large, the very small, the very long ago, the very yet to come, the very powerful and unpowerful. We make a nest within an arbitrary reality made up of comfortable and recognizable scale. We all catch a glimpse of this when, perhaps ill-advisedly, we stare into a starlit summer sky and intuit the annihilating immensity of the universe directly before our blinking eyes, an authentic and actual immensity unmediated by a screen. We can spend days, months, years, even decades in what might be nicknamed a convenient Middle Earth, within which our gaze into the annihilating abysses is deferred. For us, any acknowledgement of the annihilating infinity is profound and almost always awesome. Such experiences are frequently interpreted and received by people as among the most meaningful and yes, terrifying of their life. Memories of such experiences can often serve as tether points within the process of determining one's own individual hierarchy of priority. These experiences of overwhelming infinite will almost always be interpreted as uncanny or transcendent. It is not by accident, we might assume, that our human descriptions of God almost always include references to the terrifying overwhelm of that which is unbounded and unboundable. As I'm sure any one of you can attest, these events are not comfortable. They are not that Friday night with a beer kind of movie. As profound and even foundational as these experience of the annihilating infinity can be, they are too much for the everyday. Few of us are Gryffindor enough to face these experiences more than just a few times across an entire lifetime. In fact, some say that we can sometimes see these experiences coming down the road and we actively seek to avoid them. They are in the end annihilating infinities. They disrupt at the most ground level our determinations of identity, reality, meaning, and priority. Tom Riddle's refusal to face such experiences is at the center of his disgraceful and cowardly aspirations for immortality. Unfortunately, most of us, if honest, must concede similar embarrassments. After all, those who gaze into the abyss are rarely fit for civil discourse. True mystics are rarely invited to dinner parties and often find themselves hermits, whether or not they had set out to be. So we cheat, but how do we cheat? How do we escape the overwhelm of the unbounded infinite? Well, we guess. We assume we invite prejudice in right through the front door. As any middle school student will happily tell you, the rules of acceptance at middle school cafeterias often rest on the ready acceptance of certain shared beliefs that define the microculture of a particular lunch table. How many here look back with a cringe and a wince at the jokes we willingly laughed along with at one of those tables or in one of those locker rooms? In other words, we take advantage of convenient simplifications so as to bring the chaos of the cosmos or of the social hierarchy into personal coherence. We tune into the home team broadcast of our favorite team because we enjoy listening to an announcer who shares our love or bias for the home team. We tune into certain news channels for perhaps similar reasons. If we know beforehand who the good guys and the bad guys are, the news is a lot easier to understand and a lot less stressful. However, as I'm sure you are thinking right now, this tendency to use convenient cheats can put us on opposing sides of a battle or debate. In order to have a war, even a culture war, members of each side must believe they are the good guys. The Sorting Hat, for example, is in the business of orienting simplifications. Each year, the Sorting Hat delivers new and confused Hogwarts students into a perhaps arbitrary allegiance to house. These assigned allegiances will guide or perhaps coerce the interpretation of these students throughout their time at Hogwarts. It, it does make it easier to know who to root for, doesn't it? So let's pop some balloons just for fun, shall we? Can we assume that Sybil Trelawney was really a prophet? Is her assertion that a child born in late July will have the power to vanquish the Dark Lord a vision of fated future? Or do people bring this future about by choosing to believe in it? What if, upon hearing Snape's partial report of Trelawney's prophecy, 
Riddle had simply muttered something about Sybil's penchant for red wine and let the whole thing slide. How many prophecies do we bring into reality in the hearing of them? The granting of credence is like casting a spell. Accepted prophecies certainly qualify as orienting simplifications, wouldn't you say? Nonetheless, Riddle gets the ball rolling by snapping at the bait and going for the toddler Harry. The very fact that the prophecy seems to point at one of two possible boys speaks to the instability of Trelawney's enunciation as a prophecy, as does the obviously imprudent, perhaps even arbitrary, selection of Harry over Neville by Riddle. There is a lot of jumping to conclusions here. However, there is one spot at least in which Harry Potter, the Harry Potter saga, at, at which very few, it would seem, have jumped to a conclusion. Very few have offered an explanation concerning the golden fire spell from the Deathly Hallows. Quote, as the pain in Harry's scar forced his eyes shut, his wand acted of its own accord. He felt it drag his hand around like some great magnet, saw a spurt of golden fire through his half-closed eyelids, heard a crack and a scream of fury, end quote. Harry's wand seems to act on its own. Even Ollivander claims never to have heard such a thing. Why is there so little comment on this? Further, how is it that at the end of the Goblet of Fire that Harry, a student wizard of, as of yet at least, no particular magical brilliance, battled to a draw with one of the most undeniably powerful wizards of the age? We might recall that the light of that spell was also gold and that Harry's wand seemed to do things beyond Harry's own understanding. Just before this duel in the graveyard, Riddle himself makes reference to the old magic of the Lily Potter's sacrifice and protection. Hadn't it been that very magic that had protected Harry in the first place? That magic that had banished Tom Riddle from his body for a decade or so? Both Tom Riddle and Albus Dumbledore seemed to rest in the certainty that it was. But were they just jumping to conclusions? Were they just guessing? Riddle chooses to grant credibility to Trelawney's prophecy and thus initiates the major plot line of the Harry Potter series. But as we have said, he need not have. He suspends disbelief, one might say. We all know that toddler Harry was perhaps the only witch or wizard to have survived the killing curse. It was this that made him famous. It was this that had given him the title of the boy who lived. And he had lived, but, but why? Dumbledore's, Dumbledore asserts that Lily Potter, in or by means of her last moments alive, wove a protective spell of incredible power. Riddle, it, it would seem, trust this old professor's word on this. He might say that he jumps to the conclusion that Dumbledore was right. How many of us rest under the same assumption as we read and reread the Harry Potter novels? Lily's loving sacrifice protected and protects Harry from Voldemort. However, if I understand this correctly, this protection is relinquished the minute that Harry leaves Privet Drive a few days before his 17th birthday. The casting of the Goldfire spell happens after this. We can assume, can't we, that if Lily's spell had ever protected him, he was not doing so at this moment of the gold fire spell. They had already left his aunt's house and along with it, the protection it seemed to have been offering. Let us look at this from another angle. Quote, I'm going to open it, said Harry, and you stab it straight away, okay? Because whatever's in there will put up a fight. That bit of riddle in the diary tried to kill me. The bit of riddle in the locket does put up a fight. It is not easy to destroy, a, uh, to destroy a Horcrux. There is a bit of riddle in these and he fights back. The difficulty of dispatching a Horcrux is one of the main plot points in the last novel. Dumbledore, if he is to be trusted, ascribes toddler's Har Toddler Harry's survival to Lily's willing self-sacrifice on the grounds of maternal love. However, in the moment of her death, Lily's self selfless sacrifice is not the only thing that happens. In that same moment, Riddle creates his last Horcrux, Harry. We learn through Snape's memories and the Pensieve that Dumbledore had known that Harry, as one of the Horcruxes, had to be destroyed along with the rest, if Riddle was to be made mortal. Apparently, Dumbledore had known or guessed this for a long time. Harry walks into the woods and willingly faces Riddle without a fight. Riddle casts the curse and we find ourselves with Harry in some version of King's Cross, with a bit of riddle writhing under a bench and beyond all help. For the first time since we have met him, this Harry does not also contain a bit of riddle. The Harry of the Harry Potter series is always also a bit of riddle. Is, for example, Harry's effective and powerful refusal of the imperious curse attributable to Harry? 
or Tom. We know that the Goldfire curse cannot be attributed to Harry. Until he is blasted by Riddle's killing curse in the Forbidden Forest, Harry is a Horcruxes, and Horcruxes are hard to kill. As Harry says, Horcruxes, quote, put up a fight. Is it that bit of Riddle that casts the Goldfire spell in the flight from Privet Drive? In the moment that Lily dies, two things happen. Lily sacrifices herself and Tom Riddle creates a Horcrux. In the next moment, Riddle tries and fails to kill Harry, losing his own powers in the process. Was Harry defended by his mother's old magic of sacrificial love, or was it that Riddle's own new Horcrux was already fighting back? Do the central themes of the Harry Potter series shift or change if we must consider dropping the convenient acceptance of Dumbledore's interpretation of Lily's sacrifice and its power? Note that Resurrection Stone Lupin makes no assertion of protective power for his son, born of the willing self-sacrifice of his parents. We must not, I would suggest, fall for convenient assumptions, for such is the path by which prejudice is welcomed in. There are, it would seem, two endings to the Harry Potter series, just as there are two endings to Lowry's The Giver. There is one for early readings and one for later ones. One sees the second ending only when one is ready. As Moses Maimonides has always suggested, we receive the interpretation of our religion that we are ready to accept. In order to receive a new interpretation, we must relinquish those earlier and perhaps nostalgic interpretations whose usefulness have run their course, abandoning Puff the magic dragon without a second thought. This spiritual or individual development happens at a certain pace, and that is in the hands of each individual interpreter. Dumbledore, it would seem, had long known that Harry would have to be sacrificed because he had long known that he, Harry, was a Horcrux. He had almost certainly knew or guessed that Harry's survival of the killing curse could be attributed to his, Harry's, resilience as a Horcrux. Why then did he tell everyone that Lily's love, the protection of one by means of the willing self-sacrifice of another, had done the trick? In The Prisoner of Azkaban, we find Harry in two places at once. On one side of the lake, he is desperate and gazes with deep conviction upon what is for him the reality of his father. On the other side, he is becoming aware that he had not, in fact, seen his father. On the first side, he is at wit's end and hoping for rescue. On the other side, he moves beyond the hope for rescue, asking instead if there's anything he, he himself can do in this desperate situation. Many have called attention to what can appear to be Christian overtones in the Harry Potter series as a whole and in the last novel of the series in particular. In fulfillment of a prophecy and in the name of those he loves, Harry walks willingly to his death. However, Christianity is a text, and that text must be individually interpreted if it is to have individual relevance. More importantly, perhaps, I may come to authentic, even if exceedingly different interpretations at different points in my own journey through the Forest of Dean. We can read the Harry Potter series as a testament to the protection I can receive by means of another's loving self-sacrifice. However, such a story would have, would have held little comfort or value for a young man casting about for the courage to willingly walk into the forbidden forest. A person like that would need to read the story differently. <laughs>